The topics and opinions expressed on the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4WN Radio, its employees, or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4WN Radio. Let's listen as Lorraine LaPointe, coach therapist, educator, speaker, and founder of Head Heart Synergy brings together another enlightened guest to inspire and motivate us to move forward, achieve our dreams and desires, so that we experience midlife awakening. And I'm your host, Lorraine LaPointe. Today we'll enjoy another candid conversation that reveals how to bring back a sense of balance and how to find forward focus. Today, Take just a few moments to join us as we explore the possibilities and the perspectives that provide us with greater inner peace, power, passion, and purpose. Because that's what I call living at the edge of fulfillment in a midlife awakening. Well, hello and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers all over the world. And you know, You may know that making a difference in the world tops the list for so many people when they're asked about the purpose and their meaning in life. And it has been said that most have the desire, some know how, however, few actually accomplish what they desire in this. And have you ever wondered why that is? Well, John Bates said, when you say no to an opportunity to speak, you are also unequivocally saying no to your opportunity to make a difference, period. And since public speaking happens anytime you're not talking to yourself, it kind of happens quite a bit. And so how come there are so many fears surrounding it, I wonder? Well, let's talk for a moment about the fear because fear can stop you from moving forward in your life. It can stop you from doing business. It can prevent you from, let's say, picking up the phone and and talking and reaching out to others. It can have you believing that maybe you don't know how to, how to answer someone's question. You know, that, that famous question, like, what do you do? And that can sometimes uh, trigger an almost sense of, panic inside is as you try and try and answer it in a succinct and and clear and specific way you know um it's almost as if we are concerned about seizing up or going blank or having nothing of value to share and um as our guest has said in her speeches that uh, we're not in any physical danger you know, when we speak, but there's so much fear that we'll, you know, shame ourselves and be criticized or, or worse, be rejected um, when we speak. And, um, you know, we recently saw this with the prime minister um, of our, our own prime minister as he entered the European parliament. And I can only imagine his experience as the bulk of the other world leaders got up and left the amphitheater. They spoke so loudly with their feet. And the of the leaders who stayed, three also spoke openly against him. He was criticized for his deplorable actions against his own citizens here in Canada. And they had actually said he undermined democracy in his own country. And although our media were very quiet about it here, all of Europe knows what happened. And that, you know, at least one leader spoke very eloquently as she directly asked him to remove himself from her presence. Wow. Justin Trudeau shamed himself so spectacularly Um, on the world stage during a recent protest in Canada, his cowardly actions demonstrated his failure as a political leader and worse, his disdain for Canadian democracy. And as he stood alone on that stage, no one wanted to hear his thoughts. And luckily for him, 
he was well trained because it was very easy to understand the statistic that shows the only fear greater than the fear of death is that of public speaking. And you can only imagine how he felt standing on that stage, knowing no one respected him. You know, Mark Twain said there are only two types of speakers, those who are nervous, those who are liars. And it didn't matter if he was nervous, but it certainly mattered that he had been exposed as a liar. And although no amount of speaking techniques could save him from his own deplorable actions, it's my guess that in that moment he would have given anything to have someone like today's guest on his team. Because after sur uh, surpassing the 80-year milestone, our guest has definitely been around long enough to understand how to resolve being petrified of failing. You know, and she probably even has some great ideas about straightening, straightening out liars, even when that manages to make himself look like such an idiot. You know, our guest says communication is a three-legged stool and we all know what happens when one of the legs is missing. So I believe each of us has a unique message inside that enables us to share our gifts and reach our goals, no matter whether we believe we've tried and failed or are just truthfully speaking in front of others. Myself and, and I, our guest knows that to help um, each, ourselves, we can ramp up the power of our ability to connect with others and communicate effectively, whether that's speaking on the phone or speaking to someone in person or even on stage. And our guest has some practical strategies to share because everyone has a story. And it's important to communicate our message with authority, with with purpose, with clarity, and to let our light shine. So speaking of lights and shining, for those I haven't met yet, I'm Lorraine LaPointe. And if you know that you have blocks to remove, if you have self-sabotaging behaviors and patterns to transform gifts that you want to activate, if you have a message that you want to serve or love to give a deeper relationship, then maybe I'm the right guide for you. Because as your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs shift, you become more fulfilled and purposeful in your life. And who doesn't want that, right? You get stronger and broader perspectives and your awareness allows you to see possibilities. And you can see the opportunities that were unavailable to you before. And that's one reason why I reach out through this radio and talk for TV program to create an inspiring, safe and sacred place where we can explore all these different ways to live with greater peace, power, passion and purpose. So today, whether you're here live or you've come across us later on, we invite you to engage and connect with us as we broadcast here each week on all kinds of different social media platforms. You're invited to let us know when you find something in the conversation curious or interesting or makes you go, hmm, because by simply adding your comments and questions, our wonderful show producer who works so hard behind the scenes will post them for us so that you can shape this program into something that is most interesting to you. So today I invite you to take a moment, invite your friends and family and uh, stay tuned here as we develop your authentic um, sense of speaking um, here on the edge of fulfillment. We are on w4wn.com or talkfortv.com and we'll be right back after this short break. Mental fitness, the missing X factor for enhancing performance, achievement, and success. Mental fitness empowers you with the magic of three. Stabilized mood, peace of mind, deeper relationships. Time to make it happen? Grow the self-command muscle. Intercept your self-defenses. Build your inner wisdom. 
In less than 15 minutes a day, gain the missing X factor. Let me show you how. There comes a time we wonder, what's next? For women like us, as we stand at the edge of fulfillment, are you feeling unsettled, restless, not quite right? That's midlife awakening. Are you looking for fulfillment? Or to squeeze more juice out of life? Midlife awakening at the edge of fulfillment, don't miss it. We understand. By phone or laptop, wherever you are, come join us. Friday 10 a.m. Eastern Time, on Head Heart Synergy Facebook business page, or here, on the Women for Women Network Radio and Talk 4 TV. Hey, welcome back. Today we're going to meet a really special guest. She's known as a communication confidence coach. And she is going strong over 80. I don't think she'll mind me telling you that. And she intends to still be fabulous at 100. She's been named top speaking coach of the year, top motivational speaker of the decade. She's also an international best-selling author who's coached reluctant speakers for more than 40 years. And that's through her company, Vibrant Vocal Power. Marjorie helps people find their voice, helps them overcome those fears I was talking about, and to communicate with such confidence and skill that they easily reach their professional goals and their personal goals to make a positive impact in the world. And I'm going to stop talking about her and welcome her to the edge of fulfillment, Marjorie Salson. Thank you, Lorraine. And I am absolutely thrilled to say that I'm 82 because I consider ageism no more attractive than any of the other isms around. And women in particular get labeled the old crones or riches or whatever as we grow older. And the heck with that. Let's be who we are. And the fact is that I feel blessed for every year that I am granted because every year is an opportunity for growth and expansion. And that's how I view life. You are an inspiration to to us all, especially especially to me. Good morning, Sherry. Lovely to have you here. And and I agree with you. I think you should be going strong till you're a hundred at least. Well, <laughs> I, I like to say a hundred plus. I don't want to limit myself. But that's true. We wouldn't want to <laughs> do that. Well, thank you for being with us today. And I understand that you were not always the confident professional speaker that we see and appreciate here today. I'm no wondering way. where where would you like to begin your story? Well, the, it's interesting. Uh, my very first business coach, Pamela Bruner, said something I've never forgotten, Lorraine. She said, your mess is your message. Mm. And... <laughs> Oh, which one to choose? <laughs> yes. Well, the, the funny thing is, one of the reasons I came up with uh, something you quoted earlier, that public speaking is any time you speak to somebody other than yourself. I thought that because was I never really had a huge amount of trouble with what people consider public speaking, namely giving a speech. Maybe because I was, you know, a goody two-shoes who wanted to shine in school, was always raising my hand to answer the question. Uh, but the other stuff, you know, me, personal meeting people, which in business is networking very often or picking up the phone, those things were really hard for me because basically I was and still am in many ways a shy introvert. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, that's so. amazing for a public, for somebody who's into public speaking, because people don't often know that I'm very introverted. Um, I have an extroverted side that I bring out. I trot out every once in a while, like on this show, but Typically, I'm introverted as well. So awesome to, to know that you can be such an accomplished speaker. Well, and the thing is that you when know. you have a challenge and you work your way through to figure it out and get to the other side somehow, then there's an obligation to help other people with that same challenge. Oh. And there are so many people who have wonderful things to share, gifts that other people need desperately, and they're afraid to share it. And you know what they say at the end of life? People don't regret what they did do so much as what they didn't do. And why didn't they do it? Oh, that's a stupid idea. That'll never work. Where'd you come up with that one? You know, People are so afraid to really share what they really would like to do in life, and they don't do it. 
And then they beat themselves up for not doing it. So my goal is always to help people what I call bust out of the jail of their comfort zone because everything you want is outside of your comfort zone. And so yeah. my goal is to help people tiptoe out in a way that feels uh, affirming. Yeah, so in school, you were the, the, the one that had her hand raised, but were you, was that always the case for you? Were you always confident in who you were and wanted well, to? Well, I don't know if I was confident or... so much as I wanted to, to get good grades, you know. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the motivation appears. The, the funny thing is, in high school, my nickname was The Brain. And of course, in the high school, that was not a compliment. <laughs> No, so that 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 complicated my s developing good social skills because I was the brain. <laughs> well, it's like when I was in uh, high school, people who were into tech and that kind of stuff were the nerds, and everybody, oh, they're the nerds. I mean, the nerds now rule the world. <laughs> yeah, right. You end up working for the the, the kid you laughed at in high school. <laughs> but that that's true. But the thing is uh, that it's really true that it's important to wrestle those fears to the ground so you can share your message. Now, I, I, I shared as that communication is a three-legged stool. So let me just put this mm. stool out there and what those legs are. That and then seeing you've been talking a lot about the fear helps some people with the fear piece. So a three-legged stool, when one is missing, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, not 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 something you want to sit on for long, is it? No. And what are the legs? They're what, how, and allow. What is your message? Is it clear? Is it concise? Is it compelling? Is it in the language that your ideal people say, ah, he gets me. She understands me. And people are attracted to your message. The how is how are you presenting it? And there's two hows. People think of public speaking and they think that's the only how. And true, presenting yourself orally is really important, but also visually, because I think we've all gotten emails that are what I call the sub stream of consciousness, big blob of text in a small font that the human eye cannot read, <laughs> and, or there's death by PowerPoint. Okay. So when you're in business, you need both the visual and the oral skills. And seeing I'm a trained uh, author and a mag former magazine editor and a trained voice actor and all of that stuff and got my master's in audiovisual education from Michigan, I definitely help people with their messaging and how they present it visually and orally. But the third leg is the one that stops a lot of people. And that's mm -hmm. the allow. Are you allowing yourself to share your gifts? Because there are people out there who desperately need them. And people have all kinds of excuses. Oh, well, you know, a lot of people uh, can do what I do. I don't need to do it. The reality is mm. everything's based on relationship. And you build that through communication. And there are some people who can only hear that communication from you. I don't know, I know enough to share. I, as Pamela Bruner taught, to a kindergartner, a first grader is a genius. <laughs> That's whatever you know about your field is more true. than who, the person with whom you're talking. That is Unless so it's somebody who's coaching you. But the, thing, the fact of the matter is that we all have gifts to share. And there are all people out there who need those gifts and can only receive them really from us. So mm -hmm. it's our obligation to overcome those fears. Because that way we are fulfilling our purpose in helping other people become more of who they are. And I kind of consider myself like a pebble. You know, you throw a pebble into a pond and then the, you know, the waves kind of radiate out. My goal is to feel free people so that their waves can radiate out and help the people they meet, meet, are meant to help. And there are basically three basic fears. The first one is criticism. Mm. I, you know, and I sometimes think, Lorraine, that goes back to our childhood. I think criticism may be teachers and parents' main method to civilize us as we're growing up and yeah. you know and as little kids we have no way of, of the, the, the criticism is wounding and you know we have no way of healing ourselves of those wounds necessarily and so when somebody criticizes them, us it's like 
the poking at an old wound. Well, and as children, we have to believe what, good morning, Christine. We have to believe that what the bigger, older people who provide our survival, <laughs> we have to believe what they say is true. So if they criticize us and tell us something about ourselves, you know, uh, like if, for example, when I was young, I, I often tell this story. I was singing away in the car, the back seat of the car. My mother turned around and she said, oh, for goodness sake, give it a rest. <laughs> I never sang again. Oh, my. So, so I, I know she didn't mean to, to do that. Like, that wasn't an intentional, like, don't ever sing again. And I probably have a, a horrid voice. I don't know. Um, but, but adults aren't aware that their criticisms can go to a child's core. Right. So, so let me share with you two methods uh, that I have found to deal with criticism. One. And the, fir the first is a gift to my late husband. I was working uh, at creating some change in my synagogue. I wanted to go egalitarian. And as you can imagine, <clears throat> when religious views come into, uh, into uh, uh, conflict, there's a you know, a little resistance. They say the only one who welcomes change is a wet baby. Oh. <laughs> and, and, and changes in religious practice, woo hoo hoo. Ooh. So anyway, while I was involved in this struggle, which by the way, we ended up winning. But anyway, uh, somebody said something to me that was really, really hurtful. And I came home and I, and I, I told Saul what that person said. And he said three words, three words. Consider the source. Oh, yes. <laughs> and there's two things about considering the source. Number one, there are some people that I put in the category of Billy Bully or Sally Sniper, with apologies to all the nice Billies and Sallies in the world. But those people live to try and tear other people down so they can make themselves feel better. And that's a person whose opinion is worth zip. That source is worth zip. The other thing is, is this source somebody who's knowledgeable or might have a good idea? The thing is that people really don't know how to give uh, suggestions as suggestions and not as criticism. So sometimes I'd like to say that a good suggestion could be dressed up in the bad clothing of criticism. Mm. And so unless you think you're the Encyclopedia Britannica on your subject, there might be something new to learn. And maybe that person has a kernel of an idea that will enhance your own understanding. So you need to kind of, you know, soothe the inner wounded inner child within. Come into your adult self and say, is there something good to learn here? Every, I, I love it because one of my mentors says that everybody is 10% right. Even when you're convinced they're dead wrong, find <laughs> 10% that they mm -hmm. are right. Yes. So that, that's, that's kind of my criticism thing. Now, rejection is another piece. If you ever go to my website, Vibrant Vocal Power, you will see on the website there is a lighthouse. Michigan, where I live, has more lighthouses than any other state in the United States because we are on four of the five Great Lakes, which is like being on four oceans without any salt. That's how big they are. Yeah. And so we have all these lighthouses. And my metaphor for your message is it's a lighthouse. Mm. It's designed to shine light on the people who need to, to see that light. And a lighthouse does not run up and down the shore after the boats that pass it by. It's just there shining light for the boats that need it. And a well-crafted message is a lighthouse. It's designed to attract the people who need what you offer and to actually let all the other people say, I don't need that, or I don't need it now. It's a sorting message mechanism. So if that's, you have a that's a very cool way of looking at it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The thing is that if, and if some people are rejecting your message that you know are right for, then take a look at your message. It, it needs some polishing. <laughs> the lens of your light needs a little polishing. Uh, but that's, you know, and the thing is that, uh, I always consider, for example, my late Aunt Rosalind had a riff 
on a verse from Ecclesiastes that to me perfectly describes marketing. In other words, sharing your message out in the world. Mm -hmm. Cast your bet upon the waters. Sometimes it comes back soggy and sometimes it comes back cheesecake. <laughs> the thing is, you put yourself out there and you share your message and some people will say, ah, and other people, eh. and you don't need the end eh in the world. But the other thing is this, there's, there's a, you know, when, when you share something, for example, if you're in a networking event or whatever, and you share something, you know, some people will say, ah, I need it. Some people will need it down the road. Some people will find, will know somebody that needs it. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, you should talk to Marjorie because she can help you with that. You should talk to Lorraine. She deals with people who are sabotaging themselves. The thing is that you are sharing your gifts and you're letting the people know that they, they're there in an effective and compelling way. And the right people will, will either say yes, or they'll let other people who need you find out about you. And that reminds me, Lorraine, I went to this, uh, have you ever been to a speed networking event where every two minutes you talk to somebody else? I, I've heard of them. I have not had the, I, I was going to say the pleasure myself. I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> well, let me tell you, they're really something. Before the lockdown in December in Michigan, there was one by my local chamber and I'm looking at the weather and I'm thinking about the driving. I think, uh, should I go? Eh, I'll go. So I went and you know, the way these are designed, there's a long table and some people sit on one side of the table and they sit there and the people on the other side, every two minutes, guess which side of the table I was on. <laughs> I was on the move your tush every two minutes side of the table. So I did that. I came home. I thought, eh. About four months later, I get this phone call, Lorraine. And this guy says, my name is Michael. I met you at the speed networking event. You probably don't remember me. No, I don't remember him at all. From the, <laughs> I mean, you know, it was like the whole thing was a blur in my mind. Turns out he had given my car to his wife. And he was invited to speak at an event for a very important, you know, event. And he was one of those people. He came to me, you know, people come to me for three reasons. Either they're, they don't have a message. They want help with the message or they don't know how to present it or they're scared out of their wits. He was, he was in the third category. He said to me that if he got up to speak in public, I mean, he couldn't even see the audience. It was like this gray blur or the fuzz when the TV signal goes. And so he came to me you know, from the fear piece. Mm -hmm. What happened is he was complaining to his wife ah, and she dragged out my card and said, call her. And isn't so, it awesome that he had shared that with her so that she could at a later date, give it back to him. But the funny thing about it, and, and it, it, it fits in with my belief that the, that the foundation, the foundation of your speaking confidence is knowing you've got a really good message. And so when I work with people, which is always on Zoom so they can record the session, I, I share a Google Doc and I said, please put in that Google Doc the message you want to share. Mm -hmm. Well, Lorraine, I read it about three times. And I finally, when I met with Michael, I said, you know, I got to give you a little tough love. I said, when I was at Michigan, I took a philosophy course and I found those guys easier to understand than reading your message. And if I can't understand reading it, nobody's going to understand it, hearing it, but you've got some good ideas. So let's do a little dental extraction, pull out your three best ideas. And we ended up creating a really powerful message for him. And the funny thing about it is, and I, and I gave him all kinds of rehearsal techniques and all kinds of overcoming fear techniques and so forth. And he was rehearsing and da, 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 da. And the funny thing about it is our last session, I, I had told him he had to promise to tell me what happened with the, the talk because it was going to be after our last session together. Well, he came to our last session, Lorraine, and he said, you'll never guess what happened. What happened? He said he went to the meeting of this organization and the person chairing the meeting came up to him. And this is the, the a chairman's worst fear because the, the speaker didn't show up. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> And said, you know, the speaker, whoever it is, didn't show up. Can you speak instead? And he said he immediately went to his fair place. And then he heard 
my voice in his ear saying, stop running horror movies in your mind. <laughs> so he got up, he started visualizing all the stuff that I had trained him. And he, he knew that talk so well. He had rehearsed it so much using the techniques I had taught him that he, without a not, no, without a card, without anything, he got up, he gave the speech and got huge applause. And that's um, what can happen. That's so awesome. That is awesome. Well, and, and it's interesting because we do run those horror movies in our minds. And that's <laughs> why I talked about that situation in Europe. I don't know if you're aware of that or if you saw videos of that about what happened to our prime minister. No. And um, now listen, O Canada is north of the border. Although in Michigan and Detroit, you actually have to go south to get to Windsor, Ontario. There, there, there you go. But he was on the world stage in the European Parliament. And, and, and the reason I brought it up is because it's, he lived everyone's nightmare, which was all these world leaders got up and walked out. Yeah. Well, and, that's and why you have to always be careful about your message and make exactly. sure that it's congruent, congruent and, and, with who you the, are. The reason I bring this up again is because he, his message was incongruent with his actions. He was lecturing them on democracy where he had just recently demonstrated his own lack of democracy and literally when people heard his message they and they didn't believe him they and and i think that's so important that what you're talking about is that message there has to be a congruence a truth yeah, yeah there's a saying that how you act speaks so loudly that I can't hear what you're saying. Exactly. So it's really important that uh, you know that, that we act in in a way that we know the world is watching. <laughs> well, and I think that also belays fear because if you are standing in your truth and your yeah. actions are aligned with your message then then I, then people as you said criticism so if it was just pure criticism you could say like exactly what you said like are they just being bullies were were the european leaders being bullies no were these european bullies knowledgeable absolutely but were these european uh leaders going to listen to someone's message who was out of congruence with their behavior. Absolutely not. And so I think that's really important piece for that fear as well. Staying yeah. in your truth. Well, I want to sneak in a little bit about the last fear, which kind of in a way encompasses the others. Okay. We are deathly afraid of failing. Mm. So many people tell me, I don't want to feel stupid. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin my chances for advancement. If you're in a company, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to ruin my chances for a raise or whatever, or I don't want to, you know, I, I'm, I'm in this business and, and I, and I want to succeed. I, I'm afraid of failing. I'm afraid I'm not looking, you know, like an expert in my field. And I, I have to tell you that failure, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that's important if you're speaking is always to have water around. Well, if you've got water, I'm going to have a sip too. <laughs> and by the way, let me share with you my favorite trick. If you are, when I get nervous, and yes, I still get nervous. I never promise anybody that I can erase all your fears about communicating. It's, there's always some little area where we're less comfortable than others. Mm -hmm. I'm still not so comfortable about picking up the phone. I do it, and I know how to get over the fear of doing it, but eh, it's still a little there. When I get nervous and when I'm about to, to do something, uh, my mouth gets as dry as the Sahara Desert. Oh. Now, it doesn't matter how much I've hydrated myself. I'm a trained singer. I know the importance of hydration. I also know my brain is 77 to 78% water. And if I wanna, <laughs> if I wanna be a little smart, I gotta keep it hydrated. <laughs> but. Yeah, it, because the truth is, when you find yourself being a little foggy, it could be because your brain is thirsty. <laughs> but uh, so the thing about failure is that I truly believe that nothing is a failure as long as we learn the lesson it has to teach us. 
So, so this is my strategy. When something doesn't go as well as you would hope, the first thing, first of all, never, ever, 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 ever ask what went wrong. That's, we are our own worst critics. Talk about criticism. The outside world has nothing on us when it comes to criticizing ourselves. So don't do that. It's a recipe for uh, increasing your fear. It's a recipe for procrastination and never wanting to try again. Never ask what went wrong. Okay, so what's left? Two things. What went well? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to always acknowledge yourself for what went well. Not only because it makes you feel better, gets the endorphins, you know, going, but you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. <clears throat> if something went well, you want to keep it. It's got to be part of your toolbox, so to speak. So always acknowledge yourself first for what went well. So you're wondering, well, what about the other stuff? The other stuff you ask, where can I improve the stuff that didn't go as well as I'd like? Or is it something I can just let go? That's a whole different place to come from than beating yourself up for something that isn't perfect. Now, understand, I hate to tell you, you will never, ever, ever, ever be perfect. None of us will. No. And <laughs> the reality is, is that even if you were, perfection is not very relatable. If you're up there talking and you make some mistake, and believe me, I've had my share of practice at this. And if you can kind of, you know, I can't believe that came out that way. Or you can just simply, you know, make a little funny gesture. The audience is on your side. Yeah. And the, number one, they find you really believable because you're so authentic. And number two, they're so glad it's you up there and not them. <laughs> Exactly, because they know that their biggest fear is public speaking. And look, she's doing it. And and I find audiences are very forgiving. Yeah. Now, it's interesting because I have when a they, friend who's a juggler. And he told me that the very first words out of his juggling coach in the very first lesson was, you will drop something. Mm -hmm. You will drop something. And I want you to think about what happens when a juggler drops something. Does the audience boo? Oh, and they feel, and we all feel so badly for the juggler. And when the juggler picks up whatever it is and starts juggling again, everybody claps. I've seen this happen over and over and over. Every time I've seen a juggler who by any chance drops something. And so pick yourself up, dust yourself off and keep juggling. Well, and that that is that gives people a sense of inspiration, a sense of motivation. They connect with, you know, how how hard things can be at times. And all of us have encountered times where there are things that we don't do so well. And to and to be able to connect on a human level with someone else, even when they're on stage. Yeah, because when your humanity shines out, that's when people feel drawn to you and, and uh, want to uh, have more of you, so to speak. Now, I always had a fear of going completely blank <laughs> and, and having that dry mouth. And I know you have a few tips or tricks that you that you have shared with audiences before. So can we address those two to help me? <laughs> well, I have to tell you, the very first time I ran into this issue, uh, I was working with a, a fellow in corporate. And what he told me was that he would sit in those corporate meetings in utter dread that he would be asked a question he couldn't answer mm -hmm. and it would blow his chances for a raise or advancement. And so I thought to myself, I've got to come up with something because we all get hit with questions we can't answer. And it, very often it's the reason people will not do live uh, uh, teaching as part of a course or anything. Or, or do Q&A sessions because they're afraid they'll be asked something they, they can't answer and they'll look stupid, you know, <laughs> or blow their credibility. So I came up with a four-step system and you can use part or all of it. <laughs> but the first one, the, and this is all designed to give you the chance for, the, for your subconscious to 
<clears throat> give you the gift to the answer eventually, <laughs> if not sooner. And the first one, and, and the minute I say this, you think, I hear people do this all the time. It's acknowledge. The system is A-C-E-D. A is for acknowledge. Oh, that's a really good question. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Oh, nobody's asked me that before. That's the A. The C is clarify. Because my belief is you cannot give a good answer to a bad question. And some questions are so broad or so vague, it's imp they're impossible to answer. So you can say very honestly, you know, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. Can you give me an example of what you're asking me about? Force that other person to clarify that person's thinking so they can ask you a decent question because you can't answer a bad question. You can't find a good answer to a bad question. It's impossible. And there are some questions that are just not good questions. That's right. So don't beat yourself up for not finding an answer to a question that's impossible. And sometimes somebody will ask you a question that's totally outside of your area of expertise. And you can say, you know, that is totally outside of my area of expertise. That's we'll, not <laughs> you will talk about Rachel's question in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> it might be outside of your area of expertise, but we'll see. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm always glad to answer questions to the best of my ability. Okay. So, you know, if you can say, honestly, you know, that is not something that is my area of expertise. Uh, or if it is in your area or you're in a, in a uh, corporate situation, you say, you know, that is something that th this other department is working on. Maybe Joe from that department can answer this, uh, give you a better answer than I could. Or, uh, you know, that's not something we're working on right now, uh, but that we are that is on our list of things to do. Let me get back to you with an answer when, when, when we've got one. That's the D, that's the delay or deliver. Because maybe by this time, you know, but if you're in a group setting, the E in the ACED is elicit, E-L-I-C-I-T, to draw forth. Not I-L-L-I-C-I-T, which means illegal. <laughs> important, dis uh, important discretion. Very important decision. <laughs> or you can use the I, I if you want to use it for inquire. If you're in a group setting, you know, said, you know, is there somebody else who can give a better answer than I can to this question? I'm not really, you know, clear on it, you know, and, and, or, you know, Joe over there is the real expert. Dump it, dump it in the lap of somebody who, who, sh who should be the one who has asked the question. But the D, the D in the ACED is for deliver or delay. Either you have managed to download from the spheres in your subconscious an answer, or if it's a question you uh, legitimately should be able to answer, uh, you can say, you know, I need to do a little research on this. Let me get back to you in however many days. And then do that. And what's counterintuitive, you know, we humans, we hate to admit when we don't know something. We think it, it, it detracts from our expertise and our authority and, da, 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 and all of that stuff. The reality is that when you can say that you don't know something, people are amazed that you have the guts to say it. And you actually raise your uh, authentic, uh, your expertise and authentic status, stature in people's eyes, because they know that you will only give answers that you really feel are the truth and according to your understanding at that time. And that you won't try and, you know, finesse them or, you know, try and uh, fake it till you make it. You are not a fake. You are real and your answers are all authentic. So let's let's answer Rachel's question because okay, what is it? that was a great question. She says, "I hear so much, but does imagining people in their undies really work?" I guess when you're on stage. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what really works, at least in my experience. Now, this may not be true for everybody because I'm certainly not everybody. I feel that when I know I have a message that's well crafted and compelling, and I've practiced it, and I can deliver it with uh, an engaging way that I don't get up there and speak in a monotone that is boring, <laughs> you know, that I, that I have a, a message I really believe in, then it's my obligation to share that message with people who need it. Knowing you have something valuable to share to me is the bedrock of your confidence. And, and, and 
it becomes an obligation to share it. Well, that was, that it. was that was such a gem. I want I, I want to make sure we repeat that. So say that 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 again. That Which part? Just, or maybe I'll try and say it. So so knowing you have a message to share is the bedrock of having the confidence to deliver. Yeah, because you feel an obligation. If you know that you can help people in one particular area and understanding other people may do the same thing, but there are some people who can only hear the message when you deliver it. We are all unique human beings and we relate to some people and other people. Eh. Well, can I, can I share an example of that from my Please teaching do. days? Cause I was Please a teacher do. and a principal for, most people know for for about 30 years and what i found (laughs) found most interesting is i could teach an amazing lesson what i thought was an amazing lesson and then there would be about 10 percent or 15 percent of the class that still didn't get it and then i would say to the kids okay turn to your neighbor and tell them what i just said and that children would say it to each other and suddenly the 10 or 50 percent go oh it's exactly the same words i said <laughs> but it's hearing it in a different voice right slightly couched in a different way and that was peer to peer instead of the teacher at the front of the room <laughs> and they can listen to their peers or they can listen to others with right a, exactly with right peer. yeah that's that's beautiful. So did we so we just to do a quick recap because we only have about uh, two minutes left. So we had we talked about the three legged stool and we had the first leg, which was the what, if I remember mm-hmm. the second one, the how and you gave us two hows, but the third one was the most important, which was allow and that right. dealt with all the fears that we've that we've yeah. talked about. You are brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Such a wonderful time to have you on the show. Is there any message that you haven't delivered yet? Or do you want to tell our our listeners and watchers how to get a hold of you? Okay. Very good. First of all, let me say that my tradition, the Jewish tradition, teaches we are God's partners in the repair of the world. Obviously, we can't do the whole world, but we can do our little piece of it. And the only way we can do that piece of it is if we can communicate with those people who need the gifts that we have to offer. Right. And people can communicate with me at my website, vibrantvocalpower.com, which I hope somebody will put in the chat or wherever. What, right there on screen? So they can can immediately go there, vibrantvocalpower.com. And you will find on my website, there is a gift right on the, front page where you can see the lighthouse at Saugatuck, Michigan, which is on Lake Michigan. Beautiful. And it's uh, five speaking landmines and how to avoid them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to step in landmines. No, for sure. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, that it's a, it gives you a little taste and there's a ton of good stuff on there. There's all kinds of blog posts on all kinds of topics. Uh, and uh, so I invite people to go to my website, grab that free gift, because my goal is to help unleash people from the chains of their comfort zone. My goal is to help you become the confident and compelling communicator you are meant to be so you can share your gifts with the people who desperately need you and your gifts. Oh, that is so beautiful. And thank you for taking the time to come on the show today, Marjorie. It's just, it's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I love to explore with you. And for those uh, who want to get a hold of Marjorie, you saw her email. For those who need to get a hold of me, would like to get a hold of me, you can get a hold of me at support at headheartsynergy.com. Dot com. I'm always happy to have your comments and, and make those connections. And I am your host, Lorraine LaPointe of Head Heart Synergy, reminding you that at the edge of fulfillment, there's always a choice. You can stay on the edge and always get what you've always got, or you can become just a little courageous, perhaps. Do some Dive in. <laughs> Dive right in. Move beyond and get what you really want. And we'll see you next week. Oh, 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 oh,